<clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, I've taken my title of biologist to engineers and an engineer to biologists, uh, and I'll explain that title in a second. Um, I want to focus in on what I see as some challenges and future problems at the interface of the various um, fields that I intersect with, and then finish up with a discussion of educating students and professionals. And I know there are some academics in the room, so it pertains to your role as academics. I know there are a lot of students, so hopefully it pertains to your thought on how you go about your studies and your degree programs, and I'll make a plea to practitioners as well. So when I um, was notified of my selection, I went through and I read the speeches of a number of the prior uh, laureates, and the first laureate was Bruce Rittman who talked about the two kingdoms of water technology and water science. And so that was interesting to me, but really what um, helped resonate with that was thinking back to my late PhD advisor, Dick Engelbrecht, who always described himself as a biologist to engineers and engineer to biologists. And so I thought I would use that as a title for my talk and, and expand upon uh, that theme. I work at the intersection between the water environment, microbiology, and health. <clears throat> I was trained as a biologist initially, then I moved into graduate studies in environmental engineering, always with an inclination to work on quantitative problems. And so that really defines what I've been working on almost my entire career. I had very, a very great deal of serendipity in having interesting problems um, come to my attention, and so that led to my development of the field of quantitative microbial risk assessment and a very, very long time working relationship and friendship with Joan Rose and Chuck Erba, who um, uh, I'm glad are here today as well. I worked on water reuse, and so this is in my written lecture, and I think. Um, I would like to put forth the mantra that, well, for a while perhaps the terms deliberate, unintentional, direct, and indirect had some value or some utility in describing reuse strategies. I think the time for those uh, modifiers is long past, and we need instead to look at reuse in the context of what treatment is necessary to achieve the purposes that that water will be used for, whether it's potable or non-potable or what type of non-potable it is. So we need to adopt the concept of fit for purpose. Some of the challenges at the interface I'll present to you, from nearly all of the 20th century, our focus has been on the use of indicator organisms. Coliform, total coliform, heterotrophic plate count, enterococci, etc., depending on the context of the problem. We now have methods that enable us to detect pathogens directly, quantitative polymerase chain reaction, qPCR. And we can detect them rapidly easier and a large number of pathogens at the same time. This is going to get better with sequencing, and I'll talk about that in a second, but what we don't know and we don't have a good understanding of is what the connection is between the pathogens we measure by molecular techniques and risk that might be posed to populations consuming or utilizing the water. As an example of this, we did some work uh, under sponsorship with Water Environment and Reuse Foundation. Um, the experimental work was done by American Water, where samples were taken from 19 utilities that are treating wastewater for reuse. And we measured Legionella and Ammophila by culture, by qPCR, and by EMAPCR, which is a technique that was developed to get a better handle on the viable fraction of PCR uh, hits that one sees. And we saw a big difference in percent positives as well, in as, as well as in concentrations. Which is the best predictor of human health risk? We don't know. 
So those are important numbers. They show big differences, but we don't know what to hang our hat on. It gets even more complicated when you look at sequencing. With qPCR, at least you start out with some target that you've identified as being sensitive and specific to the pathogen of interest. But when you do a whole DNA analysis from a sample, you can get a population distribution of everything that's there. Don't pay attention to the, to the words on those bars, just look at the colors. These were um, samples taken by uh, my student Carrie Hamilton in a Fulbright um, that she did in Australia in rainwater harvesting tanks. And we found a wide distribution of taxa of bacteria. What sequencing is unable to give us at present, in addition to information on viability and infectivity, is the absolute quantitative concentration of the individual organisms. So we couldn't talk about relative abundance, but we can't say anything about concentration. And so we have an even more difficult time connecting this to an assessment of the human health consequence. A second broad problem at the interface is emerging pathogens. What happens when we get beyond Cryptosporidium giardium viruses? Nikki Eshbolt in Alberta has used the term sap saprozoic pathogens to define pathogens that can amplify in the water environment under ambient conditions. There are several examples of these. Legionella is certainly one, and there are a couple of others that I'll mention. If we look at CDC's data on reported waterborne disease outbreaks, over the past 40 some odd years, there's been a shift in what has been attributed to the cause of waterborne outbreaks. You see a tendency toward the black as we go further and further to the right. The black bars represent bacterial outbreaks, Legionella predominantly, also a few non-Legionella outbreaks. We've reduced the impact from protozoa, we've reduced the impact from viruses, but now these saprozoic bacteria have emerged as being a dominant cause of detected waterborne disease outbreaks. And what CDC reports in terms of detected waterborne disease outbreaks are only a tip of the iceberg in terms of total public health consequence. In fact, if you just look at Legionella and look at what's happened in the past 17 years, the Legionellosis case rate in the US has gone up by more than threefold. Most of those cases are in some way or other water associated. Cooling towers, aerosolization devices, fountains, ornamental features, and so forth. How do we control that? Other emerging pathogens are also recognized to grow in the water environment. Non-tuberculosis mycobacteria are estimated to result in 90,000 cases per year of illness. We don't know the fraction from water, but there certainly are what appear to be waterborne associations, at least in some of those cases. Campylobacter causes 2 million cases of illness in the US per year. The bulk of that is due to food, but there's some fraction due to water as well. We don't know the fraction of water attributable cases. And then finally, pathogenic pseudomonas, which we really don't even have a good estimate of total case burden, but we know that there are susceptible subpopulations that are highly sensitive to certain pseudomonas species. Another broad theme at the interface that I'll present to you is the issue of antibiotic resistance. This is a timeline out of the UK, but it similarly holds in the US. Starting from the discovery of penicillin in 1928, only 12 years after were the first penicillin-resistant strains of bacteria found. 
As new classes of antibiotics were developed, the tetracyclines, the macrolides, fluoroquinolones, and so forth, shortly thereafter, resistant strains were detected as well. Some people have said we're now in the age of the end of antibiotics. I think that's a bit extremist, but we're certainly proceeding down a course where antibiotic resistance and multiple antibiotic resistance is a public health consequence to take note of. What we don't know is how much of that consequence results from the water environment or can be reduced by appropriate controls placed on the water environment. And the reason for that is there's an exchange of both antibiotics, antibiotic resistance genes, and antibiotic resistant microorganisms between the environment, humans, and animals. And wearing my engineer's hat, I'd like to know what the rates and inventories are between those boxes and within each of those boxes. And those have not been well characterized. And until we know those, we can't assess whether or not this is a problem that we really need to take action on in the water environment or whether it's more aptly in somebody else's uh, bailiwick to help control. We know that antibiotics and antibiotic resistant genes can be found in some sludges, in some wastewaters, and in some reclaimed waters. So it's there, but what it means and is it controllable by us, we don't know. A third issue is climate. Climate certainly influences hydrology, water flows, droughts, but it also has the potential to influence the occurrence and concentration of pathogens. And there are several mechanisms for this. And as this, graph, as this diagram indicates, the interactions are complex. But it could be a direct effect on organism multiplication. We did a study in the early 2000s with a colleague of mine in our public health school looking at Legionella cases in the Philadelphia area and found that as humidity and rainfall increased, you got higher legionellosis um, illnesses that were reported. And this has been replicated now around the world. As climate changes, as precipitation increases, as humidity increases, based on this and other studies, the legionellosis cases will increase. Is this a reason why some of that three to four fold increase in legionellosis has occurred we don't know, but it could, could very well be. Climate change can result in the increased presence and growth of pathogens. It can result in the increase in host for those pathogens, whether amoeba or insect vectors. It can result in increased runoff and fluxes of pathogens to watersheds. And what this means for the utilities is that will those higher pathogen loads result in the need for increased log reduction values for treatment. The issue of sustainability in human health interactions is the last theme I'll present to you. We have aging infrastructure, particularly in my part of the country. Water treatment facilities, distribution systems, sewers, are going to need to be replaced. We have some water distribution lines in Philadelphia that are 150 years old. Do we repair them and maintain the current status quo of what we do or not? There have been groups around the world that have looked at redoing, re-envisioning the water cycle on the wastewater end to put in energy recovery and materials recovery, to look at zero net energy, systems to look at zero liquid discharge systems. What does that mean from a health point of view? And what I would argue is really we have three legs of a triangle to consider and the, the, the baseline of that triangle hasn't been one that has had a lot of attention devoted to it. It's not just about minimizing energy, it's not just about materials and water recovery, but it's also protecting human and e environmental health. 
And what's the optimal balance between those three attributes? We can't achieve perfection in each of those three dimensions at once. What's the best and what's affordable in terms of total life cycle cost? Now, quantitative microbial risk assessment, which is what I've been working on for decades, we still have some important problems and issues to tackle. Helminths are increasing in importance. Again, for those of you that know the history of sanitary engineering, if you go back to the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, control of helminths were a major issue. They're reemerging again in some context. Fungi appear to be increasing in importance as well. And we don't have a good understanding of the risk posed by some environmental fungi that are in water. We need to get better integration with disease transmission models so that we can predict what happens to contagious infections. We need to look at host and pathogen physiological state, different subpopulations of different susceptibilities. And then finally, we need to look at the issue of repeated exposure. What happens over time with repeated ingestions of infectious agents? I'll end with a talk about education. This is the Drexel main building where um, Drexel started out and still used for academics to this day. <clears throat> in my first faculty position, I was told by a dean, and this was in about 1978 or 79, that in 25 years there would not be a need for environmental engineers because we would solve all the problems. And so what I just did is I made a word cloud with some of the you know, hot problems over the past decade or so, none of which were really um, understood, known, or in cognizance back then. We know that we're not going to put ourselves out of business, but hopefully we can tackle problems at the rate or maybe a slightly greater rate than they emerge in the future. There will be new ones that emerge, and we need to continue to play whack-a-mole to whack them down. If I think about the disciplines that have come in to the field of solving water problems, I can put them on a timeline. And, and one of the previous laureates, Jim Morgan, um, gave a 2004 lecture at the National Academies, the Woolman Lecture, and he presented the advances in water technology along a timeline represented by a stream. So I've taken that concept, concept of the stream and put different labels on it and called it the stream of water knowledge. If we think about the disciplines that have come into the water field over the past hundred some odd years, starting from basic hydraulics, hydrology, geography, all the way down to the current time with themes of big data and sustainability, environmental justice, and so on and so forth, we see that we're continuing to infuse the field with new concepts. And in fact, we're infusing new concepts into the field at an ever more rapid rate. What Toffler called future shock is happening to us. How do we train students? How do we, as researchers, cope with that flood of knowledge? How do practitioners deal with absorbing that into actually solving problems? And the answer is, you really can't expect one person to assimilate all that stuff. So in education, in engineering education in particular, the concept of educating T-shaped professionals has emerged. The idea is that any one individual might have strength in the vertical in one field, but they need also to be acquainted with the breadth on top of the T of a broad diversity of other fields so that when you assemble a team of those professionals together, they can complement each other, talk to each other, and trade ideas back and forth. And there's a tension, especially in engineering education, to doing that. Because a lot of the accreditation pressure is on strengthening that vertical, and not so much on broadening the horizontal. 
And so my plea to the practitioners in the audience, particularly those of you associated with university advisory committees, is push back and fight back. We need that breath to help students that we turn out work on interdisciplinary teams and solve complex problems. And I guess also, I've, I've never been in quote in the real world, but I guess to the consultants I would say, you know, you probably see that in your practices, particularly at, you know, moderate and large firms. Somebody may have a strength, but you need to broaden them so that they can talk to everybody else and to work on a team. I'll end with a quote from Louis Piaster, um, who I happen to share a birthday with. In the field of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. The idea is you need to have sufficient education, experience, and knowledge to take advantage of serendipitous opportunities when they arise. Our challenge is preparing minds for the future. I'll leave you with a long list of acknowledgments. One of my former professors and prior laureate, Vern Schnoink, is in the audience. Um, and I certainly thank all my prior academic mentors, my, my family, many funders, Joan Rose, Chuck Erb, and the late Wes Pipes, from whom I continue to learn a lot from, many students, one of whom, Kerry Hamilton, is here, and key practitioner colleagues. I'm sorry, Rhodes couldn't be here, but I've learned a lot from Rhodes, as well as Cecil Luhing and Mark Le Chevalier. Thank you. <laughs>